okay. Okay, so we can start. So welcome to the first talk of the seminar series on modern artificial intelligence at the NYU Tandon School of Engineering, hosted by the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. The overall mission of NYU Tandon is to promote technologies that can be used for the benefit of society, and that includes supporting research on machine learning and AI. The goal of the seminar series on modern artificial intelligence is to explore the many ways in which AI is benefiting the world and to discuss the most important research trends in the world of machine learning and AI. This series brings together faculty, students, and researchers from New York and neighboring areas, but the talks are live streamed and watched around the entire globe. The speakers include world-renowned experts whose research is making an immense impact on the development of new machine learning techniques and technologies and helping to build a better, smarter, more connected world. I would like to thank Dean Katapali Srinivasar, Chair of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, Ivan Selesnik, Professor Shivendra Panvar, Rachel Thompson, and the media team for their help and support in organizing this series. Without further ado, let me introduce our esteemed speaker. Stefano Soato is a professor of computer science and electrical engineering and the director of the UCLA Vision Lab in the Henry Samuel e. School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at UCLA. He's also the director of applied science at Amazon AI AWS. He received his PhD in control and dynamical systems from the California Institute of Technology in 1996. He joined UCLA in 2000 after being assistant and then associate professor of electrical and biomedical engineering at Washington University and research associate in applied sciences at Harvard University. Between 1995 and 1998, he was also a researcher in the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science at the University of Juden, Italy. He received his Doctor of Engineering degree with highest honors from the University of Padova, Italy in 1992. Dr. Soato is the recipient of the David Marr Prize for work on Euclidean reconstruction and reprojection up to subgroups. He also received the Siemens Prize with the Outstanding Paper Award from the IEEE Computer Science Society for his work on optimal structure from motion. He received the National Science Foundation Career Award and the Okava Foundation Grant. He was associate editor of the IEEE Transactions on Pattern Analysis and Machine Intelligence and a member of the editorial board of the International Journal of Computer Vision, Foundations and Trends in Computer Graphics and Vision, Journal of Mathematical Imaging and Vision, and SIAM Imaging. Additionally, he is a fellow of the IEEE. Stefano will speak about the information not tying sensing and action and the emergence theory of representation learning. Please join me in welcoming him now. Thank you very much, Anna. Can you hear me? I guess so. Excellent. OK, so I guess we switch. There you go. Excellent. So uh, before I start, uh, let me just give you a little bit of the background of why I'm interested in, uh, uh, or the flavor of AI I'm interested in. Um, I'm interested in perception, and in particular visual perception, because vision is a remote, non-contact, cheap, distributed sensor. And just to remind you, uh, if this is your brain, uh, this is a macaque monkey brain, but they're not very different from us, uh, then uh, roughly half of it, your brain is about the size of your two hands, and roughly half of it is devoted to processing visual information. So even when you think you're absorbed in very esoteric thoughts, most of your brain is busy trying to make sense of the signal that come through the optic nerve. And so why do we need so much real estate uh, for processing visual information? Let me give you an example. So uh, here are four images, and I don't think any of you would have trouble seeing that these are four images of the same scene. Right? So if I, if I told you, I don't think anybody would, would disagree. Uh, but if you look at the same images, displayed rather than in a way that is uh, tailored for your brain to uh, interpret, displayed as a matrix of positive numbers or as the graph of a function, I think you'll be hard pressed to find any relation between these. And in fact, what you can prove is that if you take images and remove the effects of vantage point, the fact that the same scene can be seen from different vantage point, different illumination, different partial occlusions, then you will find that the residual, what's left of it, is supported on a zero measure set. So it's thin. So in other words, 
most of the data that comes through your optic nerve is useless, is garbage, is, is, is not what you're interested in. And what you would like to, is you would like to be able to extract the essence or the invariance or the information in the data, okay? So uh, one of my tenets, this is from one of my early mentors who always used to quit that his mother told him to never throw away information. And so please keep this in mind as we, as we move forward uh, to this presentation. So here's what I plan to do today. So first of all, uh, the general topic of the talk is representation. So representation is something that philosophers and cognitive scientists have talked about since the 1850s. This premise that we humans maintain an internal representation of the world around us, okay? Maybe true or not, but if true, I would like to formalize this notion, okay? And I will do so using basic principles from uh, statistics and information theory, okay? Nothing I invented. And I will try to formalize uh, a notion of optimal representation based on uh, uh, classical principles. Roughly speaking, a representation is a function of the data that's useful for a task or for a variety of tasks, okay? Now, that first part has nothing to do with deep learning, okay? So, uh, in the second part of the talk, I will switch and say, well, these are the things we do in deep learning that at face value don't seem to be related at all. And then I'll show uh, the main results of today, which is that surprisingly, at least for me, uh, is there is this very deep relation which is uh, quite, uh, quite stunning. And then I'll talk about some practical things that you can do to leverage some of these uh, discoveries to make better algorithms that scale well and generalize better, okay? Feel free to interrupt me at any time. I don't bite. Uh, so um, if something you uh, don't understand or you want me to go back, please do so. Okay, so uh, what is a representation? Uh, if you talk to people in machine learning, everybody has a different uh, definition, so I'll give you mine. It's neither right or wrong, whether you disagree or not. So as I said, the representation is a function of the data that's useful for a task. So I'm gonna call the data X, and I told the task Y. Okay, so the data, think of images. The task could be something as simple as a binary classification. Is there a person in the scene, yes or no? Could be as complex as survival, okay? A task is any device that provides a falsifiability mechanism, something that you can go there, afterwards measure, and get uh, some type of evidence from. So I will think of the task as a random variable, Okay, and I would also think of the data as a random variable of which you get instances. So what is the representation then? Well, the representation is another random variable that sits in between. So it's a function of the data, so there's a Markov chain there, so it depends on the data, and you want it to be useful for the task, okay, meaning that Y will depend only on the representation, and the question is, can you operate using the representation only for getting the data, in a way that is as good as if you had the data. Okay, is that clear? So there's a Markov chain here. The data informs the representation, and then you use the representation to accomplish that task. Now, on top of this, as I mentioned, with that example, there's nuisance variability that affects the data, but that is not relevant to the task. Okay, I'm gonna call this N. So I'm gonna use these X, Y, Z, N. Hopefully, the mnemonics uh, will be okay. Right? Okay, so what do we want the representation to be? So, we want the representation to be as good as the data for the task, right? This is the first time I don't throw away information, okay? So this notion is called sufficiency in statistics, okay? And you also want the representation to, as much as possible, not depend on nuisance variability, okay? You will also want the representation to uh, be as simple as possible. There are many ways of measuring simple, uh, this would be in the sense of information or inclusion of sigma algebras. I'll come back to that. And then ideally, you would also like for it to be easy to work with, but I'll come back to that. Okay. So then the first question is, are there functions or random variables, stochastic functions, of the data that are sufficient for the task, invariant to nuisances, and minimal? Okay. The answer is yes. Okay. The profile likelihood has these properties. Okay, it's been known for a long time, proven by Bahadur in the 50s. What does it mean for the likelihood function, which is infinite dimensional, to be minimal? It's a bit tricky, but I'll not go over it. But bottom line is, yes, these functions exist, but they're very, very tricky. They are essentially intractable, so we need something uh, to work with. Okay? So I'm going to try to 
formalize this and just, but uh, before the deep learning wave came about, we were working really hard to try to design this type of functions and it was hard work. We could do it for very simple problems. But as soon as there was intra-class variability, things became intractable. Okay, so let me try to formalize this a little bit. I'm gonna use the language of information theory. For those of you that uh, don't have uh, at least a dusting of information theory, I'll leverage on the intuitive notion of information. So, um, sufficiency means that uh, the information that the representation has about the task is the same that the data has about the task, okay? So you're not throwing away information, meaning that if you wanted to say something about the task given the representation, you would get the same answer as if you are trying to do so given the data, okay? You cannot do better than the data. You cannot have the representation have more information than the data. Statisticians say you cannot create, create information by torturing the data. This is a data process inequality, but at least you would like it to be as good. So that's what I mean by sufficient, okay? Uh, then you would like the representation to be invariant, meaning that if there is a random variable n, which is independent of the task, you would like the representation to be independent of that, okay? So you don't throw away resources modeling things that you know uh, are in, unimportant to the task. For instance, let's say that the task is to recognize a person in a scene. You want to be able to do so regardless of vantage point, illumination, partial occlusion, and so on. So those are all nuisances. You would like a function of the image that doesn't depend on viewpoint, illumination, partial occlusion, and so on. Okay? Now, sufficient statistics are easy to find. The data is one. Okay? It's not very interesting. We want the smallest possible one. We want the ones that are minimal, meaning that we want the ones that, given that they are sufficient for the task, that they throw away as much information about the data as possible. They forget the data as much as possible. Okay, that's what I mean by minimal. Okay. And then, as I said, we might also want them to be easy to work with, which means that if Z is a big random vector, ideally we would like the components to be independent of each other. This is uh, formalized by the notion of total correlation. Some people call this vector mutual information or multi-information, but essentially you have a big random vectors and you can characterize it all with the margins, okay? So this is what I would like a representation to be. I would like a representation to be a random variable that is a function of the data, depends on the task in a manner that is sufficient, invariant, minimal, and disentangled. Are there any questions at this point, any disagreement? Okay, all right, so, uh, by the way, uh, when I, this question is not rhetoric, so people do disagree with this definition. In fact, one of the previous speaker, Joshua Banjo, uh, I had a poster at iClear 2016, and we had a very long discussion about the fact that, uh, you know, in biology, we don't know the task. What is the task? We don't have a task. Well, we do have a task, survival. You know, tomorrow we'll know if I'm alive or dead, and so if that is my task, now, good luck writing the likelihood function, but nevertheless, it is a task, so it's a variable task. Okay, so now, if I try to formalize this into a loss function that maybe I can try to optimize, then what I would say is uh, that minimality, the mutual information between the representation Z and the data, and the, uh, uh, sorry, and the task Y, uh, after you mess around with uh, uh, the properties of mutual information, you can rewrite this as the uh, conditional cross entropy, which means that if P is the true distribution from which you sample the data, okay, and in particular P is the conditional distribution of the uh, task given the data, and Q is your model distribution, which is what you're trying to find, then this is the uh, expected value of minus the log of, uh, so the expected value is by to P of minus the log of Q, okay? So this is the sufficiency part. I just want a term that I can minimize instead of maximize. So the sufficiency part, this is the minimality part, and this is the total correlation part. Let me skip on the invariance part. I'll come back to that uh, in a second, okay? So let me focus first on the first two, okay? So the first two, whoops.
The first two uh, are sufficiency and minimality. And it turns out that this expression has a name. It's called the information bottleneck, meaning that the variable, the random variable you get out by minimizing over all possible conditional distribution Q is called the information bottleneck. One thing to note is that the information bottleneck tries to throw away information, tries to throw away variability in the data so long and trades it off with sufficiency. Okay? So this is an idea that uh, Naftali Tishby uh, and co-workers put out back in the late 90s. And so here you have two conflicting viewpoints. On one hand, Don Snyder told me, you know, you should never throw away information. On the other hand, Tali Tishby would say, you have to throw away all the information other than what's strictly needed for the task. And the information bottleneck was introduced as a generalization of the notion of minimum sufficient statistic. Okay. So I'm going to try to reconcile that. Okay. How many of you have heard of the information bottleneck? Just a question. Oh, there was a question? Okay. Well, so I guess my question goes to the basic reconciliation because uh, is there something you get from learning y from z versus learning y directly from x? Yes, very, very good question. So imagine, so why not store everything? Right. There's nothing wrong. Sufficiency, you know, that's a sufficient statistic. Uh, the problem is that that statistics also depends on everything else, which is a matter for the task. And so at some point, you're going to face the question, how will I deal with that? So you can deal with that by assuming that there is a gigantic uh, decision machine or control machine out there that will do that for you. But what we're discussing is how do we actually do it? Okay, because in the end, the task is what defines the problem here. The external notion is just the task. If you don't tell me the task, there is nothing I can tell you about representation. Because if you don't tell me what the data is going to be used for, then tomorrow you can come and say, what is the value of pixel 3 in image 7? And I, unless I store the data, I will not be able to answer. But if you tell me the task is to tell apples from oranges, then I know that I don't need to store every pixel, and I will get an answer which is just as good with some other less complex function. Does that answer your question? OK. OK, so you basically trade off minimality and sufficiency. OK? Any other questions? OK. All right, so uh, I'll try to reconcile these points of view later. And keep, keep in mind that the task is the key here. So unless you tell me the task, there's nothing I can say about the representation. OK, so the first point I'll try to make is that uh, if you can I'm not telling you how to do it, but if you can infer a sufficient representation, then it is minimal if and only if it is invariant to nuisances. Meaning, if you take what's needed for the task and throw away everything else, what you end up throwing away is nuisance variability, which is intuitive, but nevertheless has not been proven before. And so you can prove it, and it goes both ways. Because uh, uh, the inequality, one direction is pretty simple. The other direction, you can prove that there always exists a nuisance that uh, achieves the equality sign. Okay. So in other words, out of these four properties, if you are able to achieve sufficiency and minimality, you get invariance for free. Or if you have sufficiency and invariance, you get minimality for free. Yep. Is I uh, mutual information? Mutual information, yes. Apologies. So I is mutual information between two random variables, which is the entropy of one minus the entropy of the one uh, given the other. And entropy is a, f is a measure of uncertainty. It's the volume of a distribution. So a distribution that's very concentrated is low entropy, one which is very dispersed. When you said achieve minimality, you meant for a specific data, right? Because otherwise the minimality is just C equals Y. Right. So achieve minimality there means making that term zero making the mutual information between z and, uh, sorry, uh, min minimum, not zero. So meaning that if you have a minimizer of the mutual information between uh, the representation z and the data x, given that it is sufficient, then you also minimize the mutual information between the nuisance and, and the representation z. OK. Any other questions? All right. So. Um, now we're going to switch gears. So what I had is a cost functional, which formalized this classical notion of minimal sufficient invariant and disentangled representations. So now let's look at today's practice in deep learning, which was certainly not derived 
starting from these principles was derived from uh, biological inspiration. And the two workhorses are GSD and SGD. So SGD is, is stochastic gradient descent, is the first order method. Uh, GSD is graduate student descent, which is what you guys do all day long, tinkering with architectures, layers, dropout, whatnot. So that's how we do it today. Uh, so now one thing I like to stress, because this is a conceptual point that many find uh, difficult to digest, which is that the desirable properties of the representation that I talked about are representation of test data, data you have not seen yet. Okay? If I want to decide whether something in front of me is a tiger or a cat, okay, I would like to be able to do so without having to search or optimize with respect to all possible vantage point, illumination, cut call, or pose, partial occlusions. I want a representation that is as good as the data but allows me to answer that question quickly. I have not seen the image yet. So how can I possibly design a function that guarantees properties that pertain to data I haven't even seen? Okay? Whereas when we do... So, so this is a representation of this test datum X. When we train a learning system, we train it based on past data. So there is a data set D, okay? I will treat also this as a random vector, as a random variable, a gigantic random variable, of which you get an instance. A data set is an instance, or you can think of multiple instances if you use mini batches, but basically think of this past data, you get an instance, and then you have a loss function, empirical cross entropy, that says, I have a true distribution from which this data set was drawn. I don't know what it is. I'm gonna try to find a model distribution okay, by minimizing the parameters in a class of functions that's sufficiently rich, okay, and that's all I do. And this is a function of past data. There's nothing in this loss function that tells me anything about minimality, invariance, uh, uh, sufficiency of representation of future data. These are two completely different worlds, disconnected worlds, okay? So you can see why establishing a connection between these two would be kind of surprising because how does tinkering with a function of past data guarantee properties that are not present there, moreover properties of future data I haven't yet seen. Okay? So keep in mind this. All right, so now, in deep learning, what we do is we take a loss function, typically this empirical cross-entropy, something that measures the discrepancy between the true distribution, which we don't know, but of which we have samples, and a model distribution that's an element of a big uh, function class parametric function class. Now, we take that term, we can break it down into a number of ways, one of which writes it as a sum of positive terms. And so, if I minimize the one on the left, if everything was positive, I would be forced to minimize every single term. Unfortunately, there is a negative term. Okay, and this negative term is the mutual information between the data set and the weights. And so, you can see that a learning machine can very easily game you by storing all the data in the weights, you make this term big, you make empirical cross-entropy small, and everybody's happy. This is called overfitting, right? If all you're asked to is to minimize this empirical loss, well, you can do that very easily. You just store all the data. Of course, you have no idea what will happen when you give me future data, but if all you ask me is this, then I'm in business, okay? Is that clear? So, uh, let's see if we can uh, play a counter game here. So, one solution would be to take the empirical cross entropy and add to it the negative term on the right. At that point, everything would be positive and would be in business. Okay? Unfortunately, that term is the mutual information between the data set and the weights given the true state of nature, which we cannot know, and so that term is not computable. But what we can do is we can bound it from above. For instance, if instead of the mutual information between the data set and the weights, given the true state of nature, we just remove the conditioning, then this quantity, if we minimize this quantity, then we also uh, avoid overfeeding. Okay? Now, this looks a lot like an information bottleneck, right? You have a cross entropy term here and an information term here. Okay, it's not the information bottleneck that Tishby was talking about in the, 
in the 90s, and it's not the one that I showed you earlier, but this is suspicious, right? And interesting. Okay. So, now, writing an information bottleneck is not difficult. Actually, computing it and minimizing it is different. And uh, the reason why we talk about this now is because, as of a couple of years ago, we actually know how to compute these things using stochastic gradient variation and bias. And so I'll, I'll, um, I'll come back to that. Yep. Theta is the true state of the world. True state of the world. Yes, which we don't know. This is why you cannot compute that term, but you can compute this term, which is the information that the weights contain about the data set without the conditioning. Okay? So let's look at what this is saying. This is saying if you minimize empirical cross entropy, with a regularizer that tells you to throw away as much information the weights contain about the data set, then you don't overfit. Okay. It's interesting that back in 93, another speaker in the seminar, uh, Jeff Hinton, in a paper wrote, oh, we should use the information in the weights as a regularizer to compress these networks and so on and so forth. And that was precisely the right intuition that was never formalized or instantiated, and in any case, we wouldn't have known how to, what to do with it, but nowadays we can, so it's kind of interesting that he had the right intuition, uh, as often the case with uh, Jeff Hinton. Okay? So, um, all right, so now, you might say, well, this is what we do in deep learning, but in deep learning, people don't have this term. It's not there. People just minimize empirical cross-entropy, so what's going on here. Well, so I'll, I'll come back to this later in the sense that if we add that term, we expect things to work better. But also it's possible that that term is there even though people don't realize it's there. And that's what will take us to some of the remarkable properties of SGD and entropy SGD. Okay? But the point I want to make up to, the, up to here is that when we do deep learning, we minimize empirical cross entropy. If we had this additional regularizer that throws away as much possible information the weights contain about the data set, then you don't overfit. Okay, yeah. yeah Stochastic gradient variational bayes. Okay. It's a variational technique for optimizing this type of functionals with some the, the simple trick. Very clever method. Uh, okay, so, and now let me come to the two. So remember, we had said we would like representation of the test data that are minimal, sufficient, invariant, and disentangled. We said if they're minimal, sufficient, they're also invariant. We left disentangled kind on the side. And then we said if we can uh, train a machine that minimizing empirical cross entropy and in addition has this regularization term that minimizes the information the weights contain about the data set, then there's another information bottleneck. So there are two information bottlenecks. How are they related to each other? Is there a fundamental relationship between these, each other? Or perhaps is there a relationship that is mediated by the particular architecture of these networks? Okay. And, and, and here's the result. Okay. This is not an information theory result, meaning that doesn't work in general. It's a machine learning result because it uses the structure of deep networks to achieve the result. So remember that we had, uh, let's assume that you have a representation Z, which is sufficient. And then the second term in the bottleneck Lagrangian was the information that the representation contains about the data. That's what we want to minimize. And then we had the total correlation term, which was the independence between the components, right? So, what you sh can show here is that if you trained your machine successfully, so if you manage to minimize empirical entropy, and also you minimize the information the way it's contained in the data set, that bounds from above minimality and total correlation. Okay? This is a function of past data. This is a function of future data. You haven't seen it. And this bound for one layer is tight, so you can sandwich it from both sides. 
okay? So which means that if you successfully trained a machine in a way that also minimized the amount of information the weights contain about the data set, which is past data, then you can guarantee minimality and therefore invariance and disentanglement of the representation of test data if and when you will see it. Okay? Now for multiple layers, this is not tight because you don't know where in which layers the information will uh, concentrate. It could be on the first layers and the last one or in between, so it cannot be tight. But nevertheless, you can bound it. And so if you uh, have a loss function that tries to minimize, in addition to the sufficiency term, the information in the weights, then you can guarantee these properties of the representation. Is that clear? Any questions? So this is a... Yeah. yeah. G function is a monotonically increasing function. It's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it depends on the network because this result requires that the network has a stack layer as a Markov chain and has some nonlinearities, and depending on that, you have different Gs. Okay. And so this is in a paper that is, uh, has been on archive for a while and is about to uh, come out on uh, general machine learning research. Okay, so we got disentangling as well. So this to me was surprising because the work on representations that we did, we started way before the deep learning wave. So we started in 2005 and then up 2009, uh, 2011. And so when deep learning came about, I had no expectations that the practice of deep learning would result in something so profoundly intertwined with optimal properties of representations. But uh, indeed, this is the case, which is, uh, you know, remarkable and speaks to the, the depth and of the intuition of people that develop these techniques, the pioneers. Uh, there is a relationship to Park Bayes, for those of you who know what that is and are familiar with it. I've used the language of information theory here mostly for simplicity, uh, but, uh, and doing so requires all your random variables to be defined on finite spaces or discrete spaces, but in fact you can do everything for continuous spaces. You just uh, use kullback liberal divergences instead of mutual informations, and the same exact results hold. And in particular, uh, the same results can be derived using pack based theory in a completely different language that doesn't require defining informations. And it can also be derived in terms of Kolmogorov complexity, but that's something that we're still working on. There are some special cases of this theory, okay? Uh, for instance, uh, I've left the, uh, the definition of the task very general. It's a random variable that you're interested in. One particular case is where that is the data itself. You're interested in the data itself, which could be for compression. For instance, in variational autoencoding, you train a machine to reproduce the input, maybe with uh, fewer... Uh, with smaller complexity. And uh, that the theory is exactly the same when you choose the task to be the data and you choose the disentanglement term to be absent. Or uh, people have uh, looked at extension of ICA, independent component analysis, where you have a function that maps an input X into an output Y in such a way that the components of Y are as independent, uh, as, independent as possible and you obtain that with beta is equal to zero. Okay, so okay, so now this is, to me, this is uh, this was all surprising, but now how do we use this? Okay, I want to spend ten minutes giving you a sense, uh, and I'm going to sweep uh, a lot of things under the rug, but I just want to give you a flavor of how some of these ideas can be used. Okay, how many of you have heard of flat minima? I assume that here, because of Anna, this is uh, people are aware of this phenomenon, right? So the phenomenon whereby in a deep network, which is a, a function class that is in a huge dimensional space, millions if not tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions these days, you're minimizing this non-convex loss function and God knows what the loss looks like. Well, what it looks like is, uh, thanks to experiments that, uh, that Anna pioneered, is if you put yourself near an extremum and look at the directions around the extremum and look at the eigenvalue of the Hessian around the extremum, you find that many of them are zero or close to zero, which means that in most of the direction you look at, you are essentially flat, and then, of course, there must be some direction where the loss goes up sharply, right? And people have known empirically that these flat minima have some desirable properties, okay? When you are lucky enough to converge to these minima, things work well, okay? So then two questions are, well, why? 
And the second is, how do I make sure that they converge? Or how do I influence my procedures, SGD, to converge to this type of minima? Okay? So, uh, but let's say that we've done that. Okay, let's say that we've been lucky. We ran stochastic gradient descent. It did converge to a flat minimum. So a flat minimum uh, is one that has a nuclear norm of the Hessian that is small. And so what you can show is that if you manage to do that, and also you put weight decay and some constants, then you automatically have minimized the information that the weights contain about the data set. So you remember that I said, in practice, we don't have that regularization term, but maybe it's there, we just don't know about it. Well, it turns out, if, instead of minimizing it explicitly, if you run stochastic gradient descent and you convert to a flat minimum, then you have minimized that term. Okay, in a very indirect way, but you have done that. Okay, so I think that's interesting. So you don't need explicit regularization if you are able to find this flat minimum. Okay. One thing also to notice is that the inequality goes one way. Okay, so if you converge to a flat minimum, then you decrease the information in the weights, but you could decrease the information in the weights without conversion to a flat minimum. Okay, so it's only one direction. Okay. Some people are surprised and say, oh, no, flat minima, there's nothing about flat minima because you can generalize when you converge to sharp minima. Yes, so the terms that matters is the one on the left. But if you minimize the information, in, if you converge to a flat minimum, then you minimize the information in the way. Is that clear? Okay. So, um, there was a paper that was very controversial by Ben Recht and, and our people that said, Oh, deep networks require a thinking generalization because uh, in the bias variance trade-off, we have these enormous models uh, way over parameterized, and we would expect that because they have huge number of parameters, uh, their uh, test error is huge. They overfit like crazy, but in practice they don't. So why is that? Well, it turns out if you, model, if you measure complexity as the number of parameters, that would be true. But if you measure complexity as the information the parameters contain about the data set, then the bias variance trade-off is observed uh, quite accurately. And so here's an example that you can play with the same exact experiment that they did, where they took random labels and they tried to fit random labels. And they showed that you can overfit random labels with these deep networks. So what you see here is every single dot in this plot is the residual of a deep network at convergence. So it took months to get this plot. And what you can see here is this is the amount of information in the weights, and this is the size of the data set. So if you give me any data set, I can allow enough information on the weights to overfit, okay? Or vice versa, for any given data set, uh, amount of information, I can find a data set that's big enough that I will underfit. And there is a very sharp phase transition between the two. There's nothing in between. You either underfit or overfit. And the slope of that phase transition is predicted by the theory to be beta is equal to 1. And that's the dash, dashed line. So you can actually predict exactly how much information you will need to overfit. And you can overfit anything you want so long as you have enough capacity. But on the other hand, if you have a real data set, then you don't observe this phenomenon. And in fact, given a certain amount of information, even if the data set size continues to grow, you don't underfit. Okay, so you don't see blue here. Okay, let me skip this plot. Okay, so uh, what I described so far is mostly the work of one of my students, Alessandro Achille, and uh, his roommate is uh, uh, Pratik Chaudhari, and they are uh, very animated uh, discussions, and Pratik works on the optimization side of the problem, which is, you know, all of these ideal properties, they're great, but in practice, what do we do? And so, in practice, Pratik was observing that, you know, we don't have this information term in the loss, so where does it come from? And so he set out to prove his roommates wrong and to say, you know, we don't need this term. And in fact, as I already hinted at, uh, if you converge to flat minima, already you are minimizing this term. So, the problem that Pratik uh, works on is a problem of this kind. So, what I will do is I will switch notation. I do that all, uh, always in my talk so that uh, I ensure that the audience becomes a notation invariant and you learn the ideas instead of the symbols. So uh, this is the, exactly the same, oops, exactly the same empirical cross-entropy term, but I'm going to write it as a function of the weights. And this is 
the exact information term, but I'm going to write it as an entropy term for the conditional density. Okay. And the reason because in the optimization literature you write minimum of f of x. Okay. So, uh, and again, Pratik points out that term is not there okay, when you do deep learning. Okay. So, uh, now the notation is going to be a bit heavy here. So, for those of you that are not familiar, I'll summarize it at the end. But basically, when you do stochastic gradient descent, you have a first order method that takes the current weight starting from random and updates them by moving one step in the direction of the gradient, approximated by using a mini batch of only a random set of points. Okay. So this is what you do to minimize that function on the left. So if you take this to the continuum where you know, the, 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 the step interval goes to zero, you can think of this as a stochastic differential equation where the evolution of the sample path is, has one drift term and one noise term with a diffusion matrix D here. Okay? And beta is a rate that you can tune, okay? which also depends on the sample size. Now, when you have an evolution of the uh, trajectories of a random vector, you can map them to an evolution of the conditional density of those uh, random vectors. This is called a Fokker-Planck equation. It's a PDE that tells you how the conditional density evolves. Okay? Now, this Fokker-Planck equation, if it has a steady state solution relative to some metric, okay, what you can show is that this steady state solution will actually not minimize, not be the steepest descent solution of the f that you are trying to minimize, but it will be the steepest solution of a different function, phi, okay, which is not the one you are trying to minimize, which is kind of strange because you start by saying, I want to minimize f, I take the gradient of f, and I end up minimizing not f, but another function, phi, which in the Wasserstein metric is minimizing f plus an entropy term. Okay? So this entropy term pops out in the Wasserstein metric, and that entropy ter term is exactly what was in the information bottleneck Lagrangian that I said yes, er earlier. Okay? Again, this SGD has this sort of magical properties that it adds a regularization term there even though you're not aware of it. Okay? Now, there's a, bit there's, there's a bit of a twist to that, which when Pratik discovered that, I was really puzzled, but it's very interesting, which is that this statement is true only if the diffusion matrix, meaning the, the noise that the SGD gives you, is isotropic. So it gives you, points you in all directions with equal probability. This is not quite the case in reality. And so the question is, what happens when this noise is not isotropic? Now, all of us think of this big optimization problem as kind of steadily converging in a stochastic sense to around critical points, and then you have a Brownian motion that pushes you out in these directions. But if the noise is not isotropic, when the noise pushes you out in that direction, you don't have that direction to come back. Noise now pushes you in a different direction, and then in a different direction. And what ends up happening is that you move on limit cycles. So this is a new result that is going to appear at this eye clear, which is that stochastic gradient descent actually does not converge to critical point. It does not converge to minima. It does not converge to saddles. It does not converge at all. It travels on limit cycles. Okay. And this limit cycle are another dimension of this flatness picture in the sense that along these cycles, the loss function is essentially constant. Okay. But it's not the picture that we have in mind of these big valleys uh, with a critical point in the, in the middle and noise that takes us uh, around there. Okay? So, uh, and this is the, I sorry, I should have put this earlier, but this is the picture of the Hessian where you look at the eigenvalue of the Hessian around any point on these paths. Some of them can be critical points if they are very narrow. Uh, and what you see is that except for a few very large eigenvalues, most of them are concentrated around zero, and some are even negative, but negative, but very small, so essentially zero. So now the question is, how can we exploit this to design algorithms that will find this minimum, that will preferentially convert to this type of minimum? And this is work with Anna and with uh, a lot of other people, including Jan and other people here in New York. And this is the basic idea of entropy SUG. I'll just give it to you in, in one minute, okay? So let's say that you want to minimize a function, L. Okay. Instead of minimizing L, you relax it. And you relax it in a way that is very intuitive. You take it, you exponentiate it, so you, you blow it up, you smooth it with a Gaussian, and then you bring it back with a log. 
Okay? This relaxed function is called local entropy. It's an idea that statistical physicists have developed. And statistical physicists like to write it like this. For double E signal processing folks, I think it's much easier to think of, you know, uh, amplify with exponential, smooth with a Gaussian, bring back to the log. Okay? And so it turns out that you can prove that this preferentially brings you towards these, these minima, especially when you use uh, a two nested loops of SGD, one that iterates uh, locally using Langevin dynamics, and one that is a conventional type of SGD. And the results are that not only this algorithm converges faster, both in terms of number of iterations, but because each iteration is compounded, even in wall clock time, but it actually converges to minima that have lower value and better generalization. You can try that empirically. There's lots of work that has followed this when uh, folks discovered that local entropy is actually the solution of a Hamilton-Jacobi partial differential equation. So if you start with your original f as initial condition and consider the evolution as depending on the uh, on the diffusion coefficient, which you can think of as time, then this is the Hamilton-Jacobi that comes. And so then there's lots of results that people can bring to bear from the PDE theory, including the fact that there is a stochastic optimal control interpretation of that, and including the fact that you can look at variance of this. For instance, you can remove the viscous term, and then the solution is very simple, and it actually relates to the Moreau envelope and to inf convolution and things that people in non-convex opt optimization have known for a long time. So there are all these very deep connections that are only beginning to, to be explored. And uh, when you try this, it really stuns, it really stuns us because let's say that this is the initial distribution of initial conditions, okay? Then as you evolve, if you evolve using standard SUD, you may be stuck uh, here. Or it's st standard gradient descent, not SUD. Uh, so, but what you can see here is the loss function induced by this relaxation. If you just use a standard Gaussian relaxation, you get this red curve. And what you see in the red curve is that, as typically when you do relaxation, is both the location and the value of the minima move. In fact, in a Gaussian scale space, the minima split and merge, and so there's topological changes. And what you see in this type of relaxation, which is stunning, is that the minima stay where they are, and the maxima disappear. They become kinks. And so you have a function that looks like this. This made people in math very happy. And in fact, we had this printed on a t-shirt. And uh, Stan Osher is very proud of, uh, of, uh, of that. And this is uh, Adam Oberman and Stan Osher. Um, and another advantage of this variant of the algorithm is that trivial to parallelize. And some of the most popular par parallel uh, optimization algorithms, uh, such as uh, Elastic SGD, are a special case of this. I won't uh, belabor that. Okay, so where do we take this? So my interest in AI is in creating uh, systems that can interact intelligently with the environment. So that requires a representation of the environment that is minima sufficient, invariant, and disentangled. Okay, and if we can do that, then the question is, can we design control algorithms that use this representation as the state? Okay, and how do we do that? And remember, the task is central. And what you can prove, and this is work that we're only now beginning to do, that you can indeed have the separation principle, which has driven much of classical control theory forever, the fact that you can do inference of the state. And now, given the state, I can design a controller, which is as good as if I store all the past data. It's called the Marcus splitting property. You can do that also for nonlinear, non-Gaussian, complex, high-dimensional systems. What does this theory not cover? Okay. So this theory is very general, but required that you tell me what the task is. Okay. If you don't tell me anything about the task, this theory is useless. Now, what people do these days is, uh, in fact, one of the reasons why deep learning is so popular is because people train it on ImageNet for classification, and then they use it for something else. And it sort of works. But does it really work? How well does it work? Can I predict that it will work on a given task? This is all questions that this theory does not help you with. Okay. And finally, 
Uh, this tells you nothing about the inner guts of these uh, deep learning machines. It tells you if you can train a machine that minimizes this loss function successfully, then you have these desirable properties. But it doesn't say anything about the interpretation of this. Now, many people argue that uh, you know, uh, the, 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 neuronat the, the anatomy of the neural system is very homogeneous. You know, uh, neurons in prefrontal cortex look functionally the same as neurons in uh, visual cortex V1. Uh, but Really, this theory doesn't, doesn't tell you anything. And in fact, I sort of disagree with this homogeneity picture. This is a brain that I was holding in my hand. And there are these areas that specialize and they're anatomically different. So there's a lot more going on that's not covered by this theory. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, these are some of the people who influenced this work and inspire me. You've seen Don Snyder, but others. This is Alessandro Achille and Pratik Chaudhary in the middle of my students. I'll leave it at that and I'll take any question. Thank you very much. So I have a couple of questions. First of all, so you said that the SGD is actually not recovering the local optima, right? Like it, it's not actually doing this, it's actually doing the cycles. Do we have any idea about how far SGD actually goes compared to where the local optimum is, for yeah. example? So that's a good question. So uh, in practice, when we run SGD, we anneal the learning rate. So eventually it stops somewhere right. along these paths. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, uh, uh, this is only work that's beginning to, to emerge, but you can show that, so first of all, how do, you, how do you measure how far from these extrema? One way to do it is, you know, if you have, uh, let's say, two critical points that defines a unit of distance, and then you can see how far in the path, in the, in the linear path between two these two critical points you can be, and you can be arbitrarily far. Mm -hmm. So there's no, you know, there's no result that says that you have to be near. Mm -hmm. But how far you are depends on many parameters, batch size, uh, learning rate, uh, and so on right. and so forth. So, so that's still, that picture is still forming. I see. So short answer is I don't know. Mm -hmm. And the other question I have is regarding the, uh, the, the convergence theorem, right? Because in the original entropy SGD, there is a theorem that says that entropy SGD is converging faster than, yeah. than, um, than SGD. I had a couple of conversations with Pratik about that, but d d do you guys figure out, for example, how to drop the assumptions on the eigenvalues that we had in the original? No. No. So, uh, so we limit ourselves to validating empirically that indeed this uh, faster convergence is there, but uh, we didn't, there's still plenty of open questions there as well. Yes. Any other questions? Thank you. Oh, you have a... <laughs> wow, that's very nice. Okay. Let me get rid of this.